want y'all to work with me through a thought experiment. A hellscape where you managed to convince your commander playgroup to join you in the single worst game of Magic the Gathering that could ever be conceived. Through your own canoodling and conniving, you managed to convince them to allow you to create a new partner pair, one with Oloro and Edgar Markov, the most zero intellect, passive value type of commanders that you could think of. Now, through your lack of effort, you managed to put together the ultimate scam. Ristic Study, Mystic Remora, Smothering Tide, and heck, even an Esper Sentinel in there. So at this point, if your opponent's Root, Tutor, Kaput, you are going to gain some type of resource, whether that be a treasure, a card, some type of permanent, or at this point, aura points, as the kids say. You sit there behind your Fortress of Solitude doing absolutely nothing. You're gaining some life, you're gaining some vampires, you got all the colors in the world, all the cards and treasures in the world, and yet you do nothing. Oh lord, this is a beautiful game of magic, isn't it? You get to do everything. Everything, but yet you're doing nothing and that's what I want to talk about in this video the idea of passive value and how some of this may actually just lead to bad deck building and you're not actually working towards any win condition or synergizing with your commanders you're just taking good value pieces putting them into your deck maybe you'll find a win condition maybe you won't maybe your opponent will make a mistake who knows you're there for the ride and that's what I think is being talked about in this video today where the worst strategy that everyone plays and I'm hoping to really touch on some of these ideas ideas around deck building as kind of in yesterday's video we already talked about some ideas around rule zero and how folks kind of limit their creativity when it comes to actually in-game ways to improve such a play but when it comes to actually deck building that's a whole other axis to which i think a lot of people are being shrouded by the whole edh rectification the game but let's hop right into the video itself and of course as always from videos like this i highly recommend you give a like to the original video it's going to be linked down below give it its place in the algorithm leave a comment and everything watch it for 30 seconds do your due diligence let's hop right into the video talked about how i really enjoy playing aggro decks as they make you do something and they make you play the game okay before we go any farther okay uh just from one creator to another if you're if you're watching this after the fact so these these lines are like these corners that you have on on your cards you don't need this right so we can immediately i i, I don't i this isn't to be pretentious this is generally to help you out go on scryfall go to download card images it'll give you the card images without these little white pieces on the side uh, you could also probably go into like any photo editing software and very easily like erase a singular color. Like there's there's a very easy like um, er eraser option that you have that can erase these. If you didn't want to do all that, you can download the image straight from Scryfall. High quality, everything. Um, you, you don't need corners like this. And they force your opponents to also kind of play the game and deal with you. I really enjoy these kind of decks as I, I always feel like I'm getting to do something. And speaking of doing something, that is the topic of this video. Today I'm talking about kind of the worst way I think you could possibly play Commander, and yet probably the most popular way to play Commander. And I you know what? I fall victim to this too, right? Like there, there's a lot of staples out there that I purchase and like I'll proxy uh, plenty of copies of and put them across many decks. Like I'm not rebuying Ristic Study a bunch of times. It's in almost any blue deck that I can play, almost. Uh, Mystic Remora, Cyclonic Rift, like all this stuff. Like. It's, they're almost in any blue deck that I can play them in. Just because though the deck may be blue doesn't mean I'm necessarily playing it in them. Like I'm making some conservative efforts to like make decks a different power level, but I definitely fall prey to this. I personally really don't like these kind of decks and this kind of strategy and just approach to the game of Commander as a whole, but it happens to be probably the most popular strategy and form of playing that I come across when I play. That is okay. the mid-range good stuff dirtily wordily i do nothing kind of decks but before we talk about these kind of decks let's take a step back so in the game of commander it's a more casual format that is yes. totally fine and sometimes winning is not the primary goal and we'll talk about this in a separate video but because of that things like control things like aggro things like combo decks are often kind of just they take away from your fun so a lot of these again are strategies where and you can extrapolate this into larger like hobby trends, gaming trends and everything. When people lose their agency in anything, they, you know, like they, they get frustrated. You see this in real life everywhere, right? Like, uh, you know, the uh, ideas that body autonomy is such a hot topic for some reason, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, pew pew control. I don't know what I can say like on YouTube or not take me out the algorithm, but you know, the whole pew pew control all over the U S like I, it's really just about agency. You take some, you know, the whole, uh, uh, abolitionist thing about, you know, taking, taking your drinky drinks away from you. Like when people get things taken away from them, they get very upset and they lose their ability to actually critically think about something.
Just saying. So when it comes to games and hobbies like this, aggro takes your ability away to like maybe build out your board and build out your engine and do a cool thing. Control decks have counter spells which stop you from just playing your spells outright. And combo decks are generally faster than you and don't work within the axes of interaction that you have, right? So you may bring in a bunch of fatal pushes against a creature strategy because generally, you know, you believe most decks play creature strategies. All of a sudden you're up against like Legacy Storm and that fatal push largely does not matter it's it's pretty much a dead card and so all these things take away your agency and your ability to play the game within the framework that you wanted to um just like many things in real life this is a common thing and again just like with previous videos i highly recommend if this is a line of thinking that you have that you are very frustrated by things like this in many ways if you get have a, a deep rooted visceral reaction because at the end of the day you are allowed to dislike things hey shout out to all, all the folks like me i'm a thought sees hater I hate getting Thoughtseize. Do I think Thoughtseize needs to be banned and taken out of the game? No, absolutely not. I just hate getting Thoughtseize, and that's fine. But if you have deep visceral reactions that affect your ability to um, kind of participate in society, work through the rest of your games, and work through your emotions, look at some therapy, folks. In other people's opinion. Due to this fact, a lot of times what ends up happening is people don't want to rush down. People don't want to play aggro decks because then you become the target and maybe you have to then play a three on one. People don't want to play control decks because people get mad at you because they don't get to play their cards. And people don't want to play combo decks as most of them don't find it fun to just play until you play the combo. I mean, I feel like Rocco, Cabaretti, Caterer, like, I, I, I feel like, you know. <sighs> This this card right here is probably one of like the poor design commanders out there in the sense that like if you really talk about card that takes away from the original facets of what commander is and, and we're kind of past that point to be honest. I mean this is a card like when it enters the battlefield if you cast it you search your library for a creature card and, and you put it out on the battlefield. It's a tutor. It's a free tutor. Um, and obviously it requires, it has to be extra less. So there's like different ways that you can combo out. Like maybe there's creatures that you put back in your hand. Like once you get infinite mana, there's probably definitely ways to do that. It might end up being like a soft, uh, like birthing pod type of commander where maybe you play something, bounce back to your hand, you play it again, bounce back to your hand, like blah, blah, blah. Like you keep a line. I don't know. Maybe there's, there's chains or something that matter getting a bunch of creatures out, but Rocco Cabaretti Caterer definitely is a very easy commander card uh, combo card because it, it allows you to tutor out. The aggro decks tend to be a little easier to stop because again, like the table politics of everything stop uh, like stop that as well, which is why a lot of people like I highly recommend a lot of people like if you don't have a way to follow up, don't play that turn one soul ring. Um, I played a couple of games where I've had a ramp piece, a soul ring or whatever it is very early, but I don't have a way to use it. So there's no purpose of me playing it and putting a target on my back because everyone thinks I'm that far ahead. It's better. They think I drew it after because a lot of people will think, oh, it's better to just play it. It's, it's actually not because it draws that attention towards you. Um, so that's what a lot of aggro decks can employ to maybe take like the heat off of them. Obviously, if you're on, you're on the ground, you're running like you're, you're hitting people in the face. Um, that's very different because then you're able to kind of keep up the pressure. But if you're not, there's no point in playing out pieces. Like and then you win the game on the spot and then the game's over. These are all valid opinions and everyone can play the game however they choose to. However, what ends up becoming a problem is that they big asterisks. You can play the game however you want to. But the minute it starts impeding on other people's things like this is like this is where like the whole idea of like you know freedom of speech not freedom of consequence type of thing right like it's like yeah you can say what you want uh but if you start saying some dumb stuff don't be don't be mad when people start like people start getting upset with you or, or countering you and everything right like it's always like you know it, it, it's always you know the people who are always like freedom of speech freedom of that it's always it's always the hate, right? Like it's all people who, who live and die by that stuff and keep talking about the, it's always the people trying to spew hate, right? Like it's always, it's always about the hate stuff. They're like, I believe this about this type of people. Like play not gonna get into it. mid range decks as a solution. I'm going to ramp. I'm going to draw some cards. I just want to cast my spells that I spent a lot of real life money on. And I just want to sit down and play a game of casual commander. Now, before you attack me for saying that this is a bad strategy, I am totally okay with other people playing. However, for me, I think it's a very ineffective strategy. If you're looking to, for whatever reason, actually win the game now in commander right. formats because it's more of a casual thing you don't have that same expectation as something like standard or modern might where it's a one-on-one -on -one format and you're looking to win the game so i was i was talking about this in in our previous video um 
where a lot of people have this, you know, the whole like want versus need thing that that the distraction makers were talking about, Gavin and Forrest from them. And they're talking about wants versus needs in game design and how players want to win, right? A lot of times I would say winning is the primary goal for a lot of people. They don't know it. They don't know it, but their want is they want to win. Albeit 25% of the time, that is when you win. Everything equal, four players in a pod, 25% of the time you're going to win the game. 75% of the time you are going to lose that game. So you want to win, but what you need is that you need to be like having fun, right? Like that's what you need from the game. Like to feel good, you need to, you need to fe- have fun and enjoy the experience. If your sense of fun is tied to you winning the game, your life's going to suck. I'm just going to be completely honest with you. Your life is like net negative. If that's what you think, because the majority of the time you are not going to be winning the game. You are not going to be winning the game of commander. And that, if that is what you are tied to, I'm sorry, your life sucks. Simply because the fact that it's 40 life total and because there's three other players makes it so it's definitely more of a board game tabletop kind of experience. However, at the end of the day, when you sit down for a commander game, the goal should be to win the game. The life totals aren't just there for no reason. You don't have these expensive cards in the game for no reason. The goal should be to sit down and beat your opponents. If you were to play any other board game, that would always be the goal as well. And you can have fun while playing the game and still trying to beat your opponent. Well, I think I, w- I would say like in comparison, because the the format itself is so self-regulatory and there's, you know, over 30 years of cards, there's so many different things that you can do. Sometimes people sit down and they just want to big, get a big combo off. They want to see how a scramble verse resolves and all that stuff. Like, like the parameters and the rules set in place are a lot loose. Whereas like Settlers of Catan, like, okay, yeah, you could be the annoying player that all you want to do is cheese out your opponent, put the robber in like the most annoying place possible and like all that stuff. You could be that player. Yes, yes. You could do that in any game. You could just be the annoying prick that makes it hard for everybody. If that's your way of fun, sure. Ain't nobody gonna play with you. Just Winning is not a bad thing. So because of this and because of kind of the thoughts around Commander, oftentimes people will end up buying and building these mid-rangey kind of do-nothing decks. Their only real clear goals are to get a lot of mana on the battlefield and draw a bunch of cards, which typically is why Simic is so good. Because there you go. Green, blue, you ramp, you draw. Easy peasy. It's why Simic in a casual format like this is so much more powerful than other colors and oftentimes why people do not like simic the thing is though is that people don't like simic because it's really good at the strategy that they enjoy playing the most which is ramping and drawing if your only goal is to ramp and draw why do you then hate the strategy that is good at what you want to do for me it never makes any sense now that we're done with this kind of tangent let's talk about why mid-range is kind of the worst way that you can play the game i've kind of alluded to it already and my first reason is because these decks often don't do anything active on the board in most cases what these decks are trying to do is get out greedy advantage pieces ramp for quite a few turns maybe cast their commander and maybe (laughs) cast a few more spells and by turn six or seven is when they really start playing the game thing about this strategy is that oftentimes you get to turn six and seven and if your opponents are playing more active decks say like (laughs) an aggro deck or See, this is different though, right? Like I think, so after years of watching channels like the Command Zone and and other EDH channels and stuff, like I think generally speaking, and you know what, you see this in Constructed Magic too, honestly. Generally speaking, the person with more resources and more mana is going to be the person that wins the game. Generally speaking, that can be subverted with decks like uh, combo decks or aggro decks and everything. But generally speaking, if you have more access to resources, you're just going to win the game, which is why cards like the one ring are so polarizing, not only in commander, but also in like constructed formats like modern right now. Um, It just they, they give you resources and they give you free value if they resolve. It's such a high value proposition. And what happens is that You know, when when players, okay, here's the thing. When players lose the ability to stop that value, I think that's where things can become like really annoying because these players that are like trying to start the game at like turn six or seven, like they can still be that person as, as, uh, as OP is describing here, where you can play active pieces turn after turn. You don't have to go rampant growth into, uh, you know, Sky Shroud claim into like whatever next X ramp spell. And then now you can play your commander and do this and do this and do this. Like you just build a lower curve and you could do the same thing. I think a lot of it comes from the fact that people just like to play big expensive spells. 
And that's perfectly fine because that's what EDH was. It was a place where you could play your big, dumb standard spells that aren't great in that format because maybe like control or whatever isn't great in that format. So your finisher isn't going to work there. So you play it in EDH. But now the formats become like hyper, I guess, like optimized. But it also means that there's different options. Like you could do the same thing that you want to do, but with cheaper cards or just better options in general. And also, if you were stuck in the idea that maybe thematically you needed to cast this big spell because maybe this was like it had the artwork of like a toupee or like a hat and you're a hat toupee deck or something, right? Like just get thrown out an example and then and then you want to play that card. That's fair. It's just maybe before you cast that spell, there are other ways that you could play instead of just going off on turn six to seven because what they're describing as a more active deck is players playing out a card every turn. You go land, you play card, you go land, you play card, and then eventually you have enough lands where you go land and then you play card, card, and then you kind of like snowball from there, right? You don't need to go land, card, land, card, land, card, land, card, and now I go land, card, 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 card. That, that shouldn't be how you play this. You, you need to be able to keep up or a tempo deck or a combo deck, you will most likely just lose this game without having done anything for the yes. entire game. That's when you get salt. <clears throat> That's when you get a lot of people that get upset by aggro players or tempo players because of this. If you look at the top cards that are recommended in EDH rec, a lot of these are ramp and card advantage. You can see yep. it even after just the top. Yeah, I mean, I mean, look at look at the amount of mana rocks in here. The Orzov signet is a signet, talisman, talisman, uh, Azorius signet, uh, ignorable hierarch, three visits, smothering tide. I, I, I'm not saying smothering tide necessarily a ram spell, but if, well, if it turns into a ram spell, it'll get there. Ristic study, resources, uh, sw uh, birds of paradise, uh, swift foot boots as a piece of protection. And like again, like all these options that you have, protection spells, assassin's trophy is a catch all, th uh, heroic intervention as a as a. Uh, protection spell generous gift is just a, a catch-all removal again like again like all, all these like wide variety generic options that just give you good value they're not specific a lot of these cards like unlike like i don't know boros charm and anguish on making i actually even just boros charm honestly feels like the most like out there because yeah you probably you can use it as a protection spell because your permanents gain indestructible um so that's like lands as well you could use it against like armageddon and stuff like that um but it also you know you deal four damage to a planeswalker that's, that's pretty good right it doesn't need to be to a player um but it, all these spells just speak generic value and 12 you can see even more and within this you see probably the two most egregious examples of this kind of do nothing strategy which is ristic study and smothering tithe now okay. i'm not here to say that ristic study and smothering tithe are bad cards nor am i trying to say that they're bad for the game but yeah, just small ocd moment just go on scryfall get these corners of your magic cards out these, these little white corners clean it up your, your channel you know what you got good views on your channel you got good talking points i like the way you're speaking here um you know, you're presenting your ideas. Just clean up the visuals just a bit. Just just a bit. Small things like that, they go a mile. But in most cases, they really advocate for a strategy that is more of a passive strategy. I'm going to wait for my opponents to do something so that I can get advantage. I'm or you play Smothering Tide in a group hug deck and let everyone draw cards. Come on. When your opponents are drawing three cards a turn, everyone's drawing three cards a turn. That Smothering Tide starts getting real nasty. Not a Same. huge fan of this kind of waiting around, waiting for someone else to do something, waiting for someone else to make a mistake so that I can then play the game. As an actual magic player, you don't really get anything out of this. Ristic Study, you put it down, and Ristic Study is an incredibly powerful card. Don't get me wrong. I play it in CEDH decks, I play it in some of my decks because it is just that powerful. The thing yeah. is though, is that when I play Ristic Study, I try to get it out as soon as possible so that it can accrue me value by the time turn six and seven roll around, I should be presenting win attempts. However, right. other people usually when they play it, they have Ristic Study out and they just get it for the entire value of the game. And the games just go a lot longer because their decks aren't actively trying to achieve a strategy or an outcome. These are- This is also a play pattern fault. Like I was talking about this in a previous video where a lot of times like people don't understand why like, oh, it's okay to board wipe early, but why can't I board wipe late? Like why is everyone mad at me when I board wipe late? Well, again, it, it, this is just social constructs of, you know, when you're like an hour into a game, hour and a half into a game and you cast farewell, I'm gonna look at you and be like, I, like we're an hour half into the game. I'm gonna look at you and be like, oh, are you winning with that farewell? Like next turn when we untap, 
you know, you're casting farewell right now. We can't catch up. But when you on top, are you going to win the game now that you're able to get rid of anything and you say no? I'm smacking you. I'm smacking you. That farewell, that farewell is getting ripped because ain't no way you're resetting the game an hour and a half into the game. And this is the type of play pattern that sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm imagining that's what, um, you know, they're, they're talking about with Ristic study kind of drawing you a bunch of these resources. You have all these answers and things to do and you're not proactively doing anything. You just keep holding up islands and passing. Right. Like you keep holding up counter magic, you keep holding up interaction, but you're not forwarding your game plan um, uh, there. You know, I'm thinking about a card like time wipe time wipe for two white, white. I think it's blue, blue or like one blue and you return a permanent or a creature to your hand and then you destroy everything else. So it's like, OK, it's a board wipe that you could use late, but I see what you're doing. You're protecting a creature and now you want to play that out again and that maybe forage your plan. It's like, okay, now you start winning again. Like that's more acceptable to me. But if you cast farewell, choose all modes, exile everything everyone has, and you do not attempt to win the game, you're getting smacked because you're not doing anything. Like that's okay early, but if you do that again into an hour, hour and a half game, I'm sorry, don't cast it. Just don't let the game end. Go to next. Go next. Advantage engines for a reason it's almost similar to the difference between day trading or possibly gambling or options trading versus dividend investing in day trading and options trading and anything like this you're trying to put money in quickly and you're trying to get a pretty quick return on your investment However, with dividends, you're really trying to play out the long game and accrue money yep. over time. Both of them are fine. I, think I watched a video once where someone was like, you need to have like over a million dollars invested in certain dividends to make like any amount of reasonable money off of it, like to make like actually a livable, quote unquote, livable monthly income off of it or something like that. Like your dividend earning because you get paid it. You get it paid out like quarterly or I guess it depends on the dividend you're in. Um, anyway, look, I'm not a financial advisor. Go, go, you know, just go, go talk to your financial advisor, do some savings instead of foiling out your, your modern deck. Maybe just keep your modern deck at, at, at base, base rarity and go invest some of that extra money. And, and both of them are going to yield you go on vacation. However, Enjoy it's just the speed and length of time in which you get those payoffs from. So if you're playing Ristic study on turn three, on tempo, on curve, and you're looking forward to draw you maybe four or five cards until you can present a win attempt, that would be something more like a day trading or a quick kind of return on investment versus what the most mid-range people do is they have it there and they sit around they still don't really do anything with the money that they're accruing they're still getting cards and it's still really good for them because their deck isn't actively trying to go for anything they don't typically get anything out of the value they're accruing which is why i usually compare it to something like dividends again in both cases okay, risk study is going to be really good for you the thing is that the mid-range deck as a whole is built inefficiently so the cards that you're drawing off of that risk study are not nearly as valuable as what it would be in a deck i think that depends though like not every mid-range deck is going to be quote-unquote built inefficiently like there's it, it depends on the player right like there's there's ways to build these decks in such a way that you you draw proactive pieces you draw other card draw spells you draw interaction that isn't just counter spells but like you know we recently had like a mana drain printing so it's like more of a, a, a more of an affordable card than it was maybe before um and so i don't know maybe instead of like hard counter spell you have mana drain so that you can counter something and then on your next main phase you get that mana back and you can use that to play out your you know big spell your your big blue whatever artifact and and, and kind of win the game from there so th there's different options that you can put in there like that is very pointed and very focused in what it's trying to do another reason why mid-range decks are so not my cup of tea is because it just runs a lot of win more cards really a lot of win more okay. cards when all four players are playing this mid-rangey kind of do nothing strategy oftentimes these win more cards are that much better because everyone is just trying to get as much value and be as greedy as possible towards the late game most of the time when using the cards that are not really as good in other pointed strategies that typically only get you even further ahead are a lot better because nobody's interacting with each other they're just playing their yeah. own games and eventually they may be swinging out or they may be presenting a kind of big mana combo. Stuff like Return of the Wild Speaker, cards like Marari's Wake, Garrick's mm -hmm. Uprising, Rishkar's Expertise, Shamanic Revelation, Moldervine Reclamation, Anointed Procession, Doubling Season. The list goes on and on. These some of these, like I would argue though, like, okay, some of these like inherently, like if it draws you a card, it's not like win more. If it's just making you more tokens, 
unless you're using the tokens to go wide and you're buffing everything and like i would i don't know if drawing more cards is win more right like one of the one of the cards they mentioned here oh there, there you go moldervine reclamation right like whenever a creature you control dies you gain one life and you draw a card like that's not win more that's actually like part of a combo engine right like that's actually part of an engine that can get you value and, and kind of go through your deck and find different pieces like you could start if you had a bunch of creatures that created like eldrazi spawn tokens and then now what you're doing is with those spawn tokens or, or whatever like there's like process or scions now the the old ones and the one ones um you sack those for a colorless mana and now when you whenever you sack those you gain one life and you draw a card Right. So now you play these cards that like kind of replace soft replace themselves where you play them. And yeah, you get the return on investment on the science that you create. But also now you're getting life off of those. You're drawing cards off of those like cards like this, I would argue, aren't quote unquote win more. They actually are. I am trying to win the game. I'm trying to like move forward through my deck. Um, this is my mid-range piece. Whereas like cards like um, reclamation, anointed people, like the cards like this, like anointed procession can be seen as win more because yes is giving you like more tokens but a lot of times what can happen in based on the um you know the the op's description here they can create tokens of creatures that aren't of any consequence right like it, you, you have like a rampaging bayloth um i believe that's the one with landfall and you create four fours right and so you know you create like two four fours in that case and it's like okay yeah now you're able to go wide but are you creating like big four fours or are you creating like one one soldiers and then like not buffing them you just I have them as Trump blockers, right? Or are you creating rampaging bailout tokens that you can then like swing in with? Because like four fours are like pretty decent size. So it really depends on what you're doing with them. But I would argue that like value generation on the board can be seen more of a win more option versus like drawing cards and gaining other resources that way. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe Recession, let me know what you think. Doubling season. The list goes on and on. These kind of cards are typically only good when not a lot of interaction is being played and they're typically right. only good when your strategy is already doing the thing that it needs to do in which case why not just invest more into the strategy that you're trying to produce think about it like this in my Zyrus deck if i'm trying to swing more combat damage what is this so whenever an opponent draws a card except for the first one they draw each on the on each other draw steps create a one one green take whenever Zyrus is ready to just combat damage to a player you and that player each draw that many cards This is it's kind of funny. It's like a soft group hug deck in a way. Okay. Image at my opponents so I can make a bunch of tokens and draw a bunch of cards. Why would I invest into something like a Rhystic Study in my deck? Why would I invest into something like okay. a Shamanic Revelation? So draw a card for each creature. Okay. Or a token doubler okay, in on. my deck. Why would I invest into something like a Shamanic Revelation or a token doubler? What really is the difference? Okay, but okay. No, mm, shamanic revelation. Come on. Again, like, okay. I guess uh, so. But this this just means that, like, okay, what happens when your commander dies? What happens when your commander's not out? What do you do? Right, like, yeah, you get board wiped. Oh, yeah, you draw shamanic revelation on an empty board. But like, what do you do when your commander's not out drawing you cards? Like, are you playing Voltron, right? Like this, I, mm, I don't know. Keep going. Of 12 tokens versus 24 tokens. The only time a token doubler would really make my strategy that much better is if I were to pair it with something like an Impact Tremors. You're not playing Impact Tremors? Wait, I hope you are playing Impact Tremors in a deck like this. Of course it matters. See, this is, okay, so this is the part of deck building that's really problematic. Like people have opinions like this which like mid-range decks are kind of win more they're not doing anything but then like you're not playing pieces like you're not having pieces that can certainly come together you're just like drawing cards and doing nothing with them and holding up interaction and just making more tokens and making more but like you have to do some of that and play payoffs like this like you have to play the cards that draw you a bunch create a bunch of tokens or whatever so you can draw into stuff like impact tremors play impact tremors and then like i don't know win the game from there a witty roast master or perforos. The thing is though, is that now I have to invest that much more mana into something where my strategy is already doing what it needs to do. That could be four more mana on combat tricks. That could be four more mana on interaction or- Okay. Ah. Uh, 
I don't know. I don't agree with this. I don't agree with this. Strategy is already doing what it needs to do. Or something like my Alinda deck where I'm making a bunch of vampire tokens. Okay. Dies for the one on counter and then when it dies. Okay. Would I really need an anointed procession in that deck? I don't really think so. In most cases, okay. Alinda gets big enough. She makes enough tokens for me to keep going in my combos and I deal plenty of damage. But see, this is different though because Alinda cares about when Alinda dies, right? And that'll create tokens. What if Alenda gets exiled? Like, you don't need a token generation for that. I'm just saying, like, what's your backup then, right? Like, what happens when someone is able to find that unique answer? Do you just take the loss? I mean, fair. Maybe you do. Um, so, cool, cool elements of payoff for this. Damage that way. How much would doubling that token really do for me? Not a lot. However, you still see these cards in so... I would, I think, I see what you're saying. I just don't think those two examples are one for one. I, I, I genuinely understand what you're saying. I just don't think those two examples oh, are one for one. Many decks. Oftentimes, they're also very, very expensive. The fact that Anointed Procession is $55. Doubling Season is almost $60. Yep. The fact that Ristic said... But hey, you could proxy the cards. Just saying. I've, I've said this in many videos. I've yet to hear an example against proxying that is an elitist. He is 60 yeah, to hear it the fact that smothering in commander not in constructed in commander i'm talking talk, not not in competitive environments where woods of the coast needs to make their money tithe is almost 40 dollars. yes individually these cards are very good but they yep. are typically only good when your deck is already doing something successfully in which case just invest more into the successful strategy it's already doing so those are kind of my okay. biggest points on why I think. Okay, so summarizing it all, do nothing decks, greedy, ramp heavy gameplay, win more. So the greedy ramp heavy gameplay though, again, like it's kind of incentivized by the fact of like two ends, right? So you have the bad players that don't realize you need to play the lower curve cards and build into the other things because people will like genuinely sit in games. I've had this as well. We're all sitting in games. And I'll look at what my opponent's doing and be like, yo, how do I build like that? Like, I feel like you've been doing something every game. And it's because they've generally been playing cards one or two mana costs lower than mine. They'll play something on two. They'll play something on three. Whereas I'll just play something on three, then on five or like something like that. Like I'll hold up interaction. Like they are actively doing something almost every turn and creating an engine. Um, so that's something like good deck building. And then you have the opposite of mine where I'm like, yeah, I'm just gonna wait. I'm just gonna ramp. Like uh, I, I'm just gonna draw a bunch of cards, hold up interaction, not do anything. And then I'm wondering why I can't do anything. Why I'm scrambling to find multiple pieces of interaction. I have to go to some politic and be like, yo, you need to get rid of that. So I can get rid of this and all that stuff. Like, and also like the do nothing decks, like that's also like bad deck building as well, because based on your example of win more cards, I feel like these points are kind of opposite where the win more cards is doing something though, right? Some examples of the cards you mentioned are doing something when your deck is already doing the thing, but, but that's what you're designed to do. You want your deck to quote unquote, do the thing. That's what win more cards are, right? You're not going to like, cause then the do nothing. Cause then if you don't play win more cards, you're playing do nothing decks because the do nothing decks sit there and gain free value because your deck isn't doing the thing. But then when you're doing the thing, you have cards that win more. Like, I, again, I understand what you're saying. I, I I don't think your points are inherently bad. I just don't know if the examples are that great. Some of it feels counterintuitive, but I get it. I understand. Mid-range is so bad, but also I can acknowledge why it's probably the most used strategy. Mid-range decks are bad because they often don't do anything in the early stages. They were talking about how they... Or really like, anything at all. These decks are super and greedy in the types of cards they choose for their games. And they run a lot of win more cards within them. So before I just end off the video with a somewhat negative kind of tone to it. I hope I haven't come off as extremely negative either, by the way. I, I, this is, again, no criticism towards what they're saying. It, it's it's kind of going, going to the points, right? Like... I, I've said in the video, I feel like they've, they've brought their points across like pretty clearly. I, li I like the way they're they're bringing them across. I just I think the examples could be slightly better. I want to then try to point you guys in a direction where I personally think is a good place to go. You don't have to necessarily play an aggro deck as a response to this. And that's right. not necessarily what I'm advocating for either. Aggro decks are really hard to play. They require mm -hmm. a lot of threat assessment and oftentimes they do get stopped if people have the right cards in hand. Right. But I definitely do wanna advocate for something like a tempo deck. Now, what do I mean by this? For something okay. like a tempo deck, 
Oftentimes, I want you to stop thinking about playing the really, really big spells, and I want you to stop being so greedy in some of your card choices. If you yes. ever look at the decks that I build, especially the decks that I build on a budget, you'll see that it's very possible to have an extremely pointed, extremely effective deck at something that it wants to do for very cheap on top of right. that. You don't have to pay so much money for something like Aristic Study when you don't need Aristic Study. You can have a deck that's very focused on one strategy, and there's plenty of- and this this kind of goes along the point of again we have over 30 years of magic cards and especially with the last like five plus years it, like shifting all big focus into um the commander side of things i mean we've had commander masters and everything it's it's very easy to find cards that are similar to Ristic study or provide a similar level of value to the theme or the commander that you're playing around um, it's very easy to do that. You might just require a little bit of research, maybe the card's a bit more niche or whatever it is, and it's not necessarily like cross compatible with some of your other other strategies, but it may lead to a better deck building experience, a better gameplay experience. It just requires a bit more thought, um, which requires a couple more steps going beyond like EDH rec and everything and, and learning to extrapolate. Um, I think this just comes from good deck building. I'd say I'd say maybe uh, uh, the the OP here is is definitely better at deck building if if their if their goal is actually truly met. Um, then the average support player. for that strategy and you try to play that you then play temple which basically just means you have a very strict mana curve you have plenty of things to do on turn one turn two turn three turn four and turn five and after turn five any of those bigger spells are supposed to be there to help you win the game say yeah, like, like in one or two garrick's wake is trying to help you win the game torment to hellfire yeah. is trying to help you win the game exsanguinate which is an x spell tries to help you win the game. In my Jetmir deck, any X spell that I have in there is supposed to be played past turn five or six to help me finish off the game. If you ever have one of these really, really, really big spells, big mana spells. See, this is this is an example of an actually good board wipe that does something late game. Destroy all creatures you don't control and all planeswalkers you don't control. I love this because you are wiping the board an hour and a half, an hour into the game to actually try and win the game. You are destroying all of ours so that your creatures can go through. I accept it. I accept it. Nine mana. You paid nine mana. No one had no counter spell, no spell pierce, no disdainful stroke, nothing. And you got Ingerix, what, Garrick's Wake? GG's. It should be to finish off the game. That's what they're for. In any other format, those big spells are there for that reason. Unless, of course, it's a board wipe. But, of course, board wipes should also be trying to help you win the game. So, I'm advocating for so more people to, to play more of a tempo style that focuses on playing cards early on every single turn to try to advance your strategy. Think about some decks that you might have right now. Are there a lot of cards in there that are kind of just sitting there because they're a good card? They're good in these colors. Maybe you just enjoy playing the card. Maybe it's a pet card. That's fine. But does it contribute to your strategy as a whole? And also, how effective is that strategy? Is Smothering Tide your pet card? I... If some other excited is your pet card, I'm assuming now, you're toxic. I advocating for shorter games, not necessarily because tempo kind of commander decks are more focused in their strategies. They do typically win faster than other decks. However, you can definitely have a strategy that is looking to play. I am advocating for shorter on average games. A, game, a commander game should not go more than an hour. In my opinion, that's insane to me. That's insane to me. It just means it just means the group has failed. They've they've interacted too much or they've just just let it happen. Sometimes at some point in the game, you just need to let it happen. Like if you don't have a way to win the game, you just got to let it happen. Um, I don't need them to be as quick as like 15 minutes. Not at all. Like maybe that's like CEDH games where people are able to kind of combo off really well and protect it. 45 minutes to an hour max. If you're if you're OK with hour and a half to two hour commander games, I yo. I look, I don't know. At some point you just yo, you you at some point you just have too many responsibilities. I don't know. Maybe maybe in a world where where late stage capitalism isn't destroying our lives, we have all the time in the world to play those type of commander games and my opinion will change. Currently, that's not happening. Um 
I don't want to play games that long. Think about my Moldrotha deck that I made earlier. That definitely has plenty of turn one, two, three, four, five, and six plays. It has a very good mana curve that's trying to actively get to a certain stage of the game as soon as possible. And this deck always goes to the long game. If you want to go towards the longer games, that's fine. You can build your deck around controlling the game and stopping your opponents from getting there while also actively furthering your strategy to get to the end of the game yourself. The difference between this and a mid-range do-nothing deck is the fact that mid-range do-nothing decks are just full of greed, not a lot of removal, and typically don't have a very clear strategy or win condition that they're striving. I would argue these are almost the same deck. These are quite literally almost the same deck if you just play it slightly differently. But I see what you mean. Like if you construct them differently, then yeah, they, they become like different decks. But I'd argue you could almost play the mid-range deck to be the tempo deck. Again, if you just play it differently. But yeah, there there are there are like building restrictions that prevent you from being like for whereas tempo decks often do. So, ladies and gentlemen, feel free to yell at me in the comments for saying that mid-range is such a bad strategy. That is totally fine by me. I hope that some of my points came across very clearly, and I hope we can at least I think they did. I will say I, I, I love the way your points came across. Um, I, I, I like the video. Uh, I, I actually, I'm a big fan of it. Um, I, th I think in general, like I, I think I agree with the message that you have. I think I have problems with some of the examples, but overall, I, I agree with the point. I think we can do better with our deck building. There are ways to better synergize with the commanders that we have instead of doing the optimal thing that's on the high synergy list on EDH rec. Um, and there's better ways to just like, again, like I fall prey to it too. There's better things to do than just jam the Smothering Tide, the Mystic Remora, the Cyclonic Rift, the Mana Drain, the Brainstorm. Like, like you're playing a blue deck. You don't need to jam the same 15 cards in every blue deck um, type, of, type of spiel. Like do some things that better synergize with your deck, lower your curve a little bit sometimes, um, and maybe have your big spells not just be do nothing cards, right? Like don't just have six copies of Austere Command um, if you don't have a reason not to like don't don't be playing child of alara board wipe central if you, if you don't have a win condition that's just oh lord that's a different type of commander player but anyway uh leave a like on this video give it a like uh, give it some love leave a comment and everything maybe go in the go to their comment section and let them know who sent you um i, I like this video maybe I'll, I'll take a look at more videos from this creator i'd, I'd love to love to see what deck driver has in the future